Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Please, just, just before we start, everyone, please keep eating. Don't worry about the clinking and clanking. I always hate it when I have to uh, be at one of these dinners and someone starts speaking and I leave my food to get it cold. Um, Eric, I want to talk about the crunchy issue of privacy and how big tech is not very good with it. Um, <clears throat> but before we do that, I just want to start with this. Look, we're, we're in New York. Uh, you guys are a big venture capital firm, one of the biggest based here in New York. Why here? What do you get from being on the East Coast versus where most of your industry is in San Francisco? Uh, well, what we get here is a, is a, a, a large market. Um, and New York, New York has always been a great place for technology. Michael Bloomberg was a, a great tech entrepreneur in, uh, starting way back when. Um, and of course, you had IBM in the suburbs and Bell Labs and you know, so, so it's always been a great place for technology, but it's really been in the past um, 10 years or so that it's really boomed, and it's boomed uh, for, for two principal reasons. The first one is that all technology moved to the cloud, um, and so you could be anywhere in the world. You don't have to be in New York. You can be small city, big city, and you have access to the same technology for development that people in Silicon Valley and San Francisco have. Now the second part is, is what we call the urbanization of technology, where you started to see younger technical, tech, technology workers in Silicon Valley not wanting to live there anymore. Uh, they wanted to live in San Francisco. And so you had this migration from Silicon Valley to San Francisco with all the problems that it created. Um, and so w what better uh, dense, urban, diversified, fun, uh, city than New York, uh, and and it's uh, not only do we have a lot of tech workers in New York, but we've attracted uh, a lot of tech workers from you know various parts of the United States and various parts of the world. So for us, uh, we're New Yorkers. Uh, we have extensive uh, networks here in New York, uh, and for us, and it was also by the way, an opportunity to stop traveling for work, which which um, which has done wonders for my my personal life. Um, <laughs> For those of you who are road, road warriors, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and so for us, it's been great because we, we um, build our, our firm entirely around New York. About two thirds of our companies are here. Um, it's, it's an you know, incredible ecosystem that we've been able to build and it builds on itself. And there really aren't that many uh, venture firms in New York as well. So we're not competing as much as we would be in Silicon Valley. And one of the things when I look through the list of companies that you are invested in and, you know, some really well-known names out there like Casper and BuzzFeed and, you know, a lot of consumer-facing companies, also some enterprise software. One of the things that seems to unify them is that they all have interesting origin stories. They all have a narrative behind them that me as a consumer, as well as having a product I might like or having tech that might be good and efficient, they have an interesting story. How important is that in terms of picking the right companies, picking the winners in these sectors? It's, it's, it's critical. It's, it's, it's very important. I mean, the, the, the first thing that we look at, of course, is the idea. Is this a, is this a great idea? Is this a, a, a big idea? You, you don't want to invest in small ideas. Uh, is this an idea that goes well, well beyond New York, uh, hopefully worldwide? Um, but then, then really, if, once we, we think it is, then the key question is, <clears throat> why is this particular team the right team to be addressing the, this market and this idea, this idea? And it really has to be something that is personal. It has to be that something that, that the founders have a visceral uh, understanding about, that something personal in their life happened, um, that, uh, that there's a story behind. And so we, 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 we want to know about the story. And, and, and the story then becomes a um, kind of a principal marketing tool um, in, in the, w the way that people go to market today for on, on, on technology consumer products uh, is through storytelling, uh, it's through social media, uh, it's, it's got very little, particularly at first, very little to do with advertising uh, or traditional. It's viral. Uh, it's got to be viral. If it's not viral, if your customer acquisition costs are more than zero, um, to begin with, as you have to spend money afterwards. But to begin with, the product is probably going to be not going to be uh, well received. But when I think about a lot of these real success stories, some of which obviously you, you invested in, some of which you haven't, they're, you know, they're not reinventing the wheel, right? I mean, we've had mattresses for a long time. Casper's a nice mattress, but it's, it's just a mattress. We had dog food for a long time. Uh, you know, now we're seeing dog food that can be delivered to your door, and these companies are getting very sick. The doorbells, right? Doorbells have existed for, for centuries. But, but... <laughs> 
I, I guess the question is, it, what is the most important factor? Is it just, is it just great marketing and, and telling the right story through the right channels? Or is it actually the tech or the product that's underpinning it? Well, there, there's got to be technology. And so you know, you, most of the time, the first people that are hired by a new company is engineers. As not marketers, not product people, it's engineers. Um, but just, let's take the, the Casper story as an example. So Casper, a mattress company, you know, mattresses have been around for a long time. Um, a, a very stale industry, um, and we know that because the, the industry is pri it's primarily dominated by private equity. We, we love markets. If, if private equity, in the case of mattresses, private equity owns the manufacturing, like Surder, and they own the distribution, like Mattress Firm. Uh, who, somebody had a brilliant idea to take uh, uh, a, a great brand called Sleepies and, ch and change it into Mattress Firm. So that tells you pretty much the level of uh, innovation in that industry. <laughs> um, and, and so um, uh, the, the first thing that private equity owners do is cut innovation because innovation is expenses and, um, and they're, they're obviously EBITDA focused. So we love these industries that haven't really changed. Um, they, 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 there's, there was a lot of insights in, in, in Casper, but I'll just give you one, which is that mattresses are flat products that are very heavy and very bulky and can o traditionally can only be distributed through, with trucks. Um, and if you, if, so meaning that you're, you're basically going to be a regional company. Uh, and Sleepy's was, in fact, before it was bought by Mattress Firm, was, was the dominant uh, retailer here in, in this region. Um, what the uh, Casper people did is that they invented a mattress that um, folds so that you can put it in a box. It's I know, I got one. It was surreal. So it's a mattress in the box. And the beauty of the mattress in the box is that it can be uh, drop shipped by UPS or FedEx uh, from your manufacturer in North Carolina or wherever it may be uh, to any place in the United States, any place in the world. So that completely changed the way you, have, you think about the mattress business. Uh, just one example. Let's move on to privacy. Um, and, and let's start with Facebook. Uh, I, I know you've been very vocal in, in, in criticizing them in the past for the way they have used user data. Um, they've become, through the last year and, and a bit more now with the Cambridge Analytics stuff, they've become the sort of poster child for all that's wrong in big tech. But how pervasive is the issue? Is it, is it wrong to focus so much on Facebook or is, are they actually a, a worse actor than others? Well, f Facebook is... is, is uh, more than the tip of the iceberg because of the size uh, of Facebook. But Facebook is, is an indication of what other companies are doing, except that they're being much more discreet, uh, as well as more kind of simpatico, if you like. Uh, Facebook is, um, uh, is, is run like a dictatorship, and uh, it basically doesn't care about uh, your data. It's very careless. Uh, the data was, as you know, not only uh, given to app developers for applications that are really beyond the pale, but also sold to people like Cambridge and Analytica. Um, and Facebook uh, basically believes that your data is their data. They own the data. But you see, <clears throat> someone could say easily that, that that's not a dictatorship at all. It's a utopia. Everyone is sharing everyone else's information. It's all... <laughs> you know, freely available, and, and, and of course there are going to be some bad actors, but the vast majority of people, they're just there to be friends and like each other. And <laughs> yeah, maybe in the early days of Facebook when you could actually find your friends in your feed, <laughs> today, today it's more, more likely to be uh, all kinds of uh, stuff that, that has nothing to do with you. No, but if you think about it, I mean, how would you like somebody to be complete, con constantly surveilling you can't, they, they, they know everywhere you go, they know what you eat, they know what you buy, uh, they know, who you, where you, you know what you frequent. They, they, and basically it's kind of a, a, a constant uh, depository of, of what you do. And you can say, well, you know, I don't do anything bad, I don't have anything to hide, which is what I think what a lot of people think when they say, well, I, I don't really care about privacy because I'm an open book. Uh, yes, until it's used against you. Um, and, and I think the, the best example of what can happen. I'm not saying this is something that will happen in the United States, but look at China, right? China took it one step further uh, by not only surveilling you online, uh, but they also surveil you in public through cameras and uh, uh, fa facial recognition. Um, and they're about, to, uh, they're about to issue, you know, we have a credit score in the United States. They're about to issue a social score. 
uh, which is going to start. They, they uh, use this in that province called the, you know, where the Muslims are, U the Uyghur province. But they're about to deploy this to all of their population, whereby everybody's going to be ranked about how good a citizen they are. And, um, and if, you, uh, if you're down at the, the bottom 10%, you are not allowed to buy a train ticket. You're not allowed to buy a plane ticket. You're, a plane ticket, you're not allowed to have credit. Uh, so they're basically, um, uh, and if you're the top 10%, you can do anything you want. But right? the, the so I'm not saying this is going to happen in the U.S. I'm just saying a good example of what but this is. But this is you misusing the, uh, as it were, the tech, right? Because the surveillance has always been there. When I, I grew up in London, we have, I think, more cameras per person than any other major city. I don't know, outside of China, probably. Yeah. But the point is that uh, the government has always been able to surveil uh, on, it, on its citizens. It's how they use that information. But coming, coming back to your point about... <laughs> um, sort of, you know, it, it, as long as you're living in a, in a good and decent way, you, people would say, well, you have nothing to fear until you don't. Um, on that, have we not been really naive as consumers in terms of we've been using these things increasingly, whether it's, uh, you know, things like Facebook or Twitter, whether it's Instagram, whether it's any number of apps or social media we use, they're all free. We don't pay for them. So at some level, what were we thinking when we were doing this stuff? There must have been a payoff. There must have been something on the other side that was of value to them. People say, oh, well, we, we had to see adverts. But that, you know, well, that, those adverts were tailored. Yeah, so typically it's, it's an exchange of advertising, right? So I, 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 I give you my data and you're going to give me ads that I actually, of things that I actually want because you know that I'm about to buy a car, so if suddenly I'm seeing all these car advertising. And, and most people actually like advertising. I like advertising and I, it could be very useful. Uh, but then you have to, to figure out, do they really need to know everything I do in my life to, to, for me to buy, to show me the right car? But shouldn't uh, you be asking those questions before you sign up to something? Well, so I don't know if anybody in this room has ever tried to control their privacy settings in any of these social... Uh, but if, if, you, if you can get to screen number 150, uh, <laughs> and if you have the patience, uh, and if it doesn't get, kick you back to the first screen because they, they don't want you to get there, it's impossible. It's very frustrating, um, and um, it's something that people should be very concerned about. Who, uh, this is a, a tricky one, I, I know, but who can actually regulate this at this point? I mean, the, the government seems, well, I'd, I'd like to hear your view on whether or not the government are, is equipped, so let's start with the US government, is actually equipped to regulate whether it understands the issue, or is it going to be on the industry to actually self-regulate? Okay, so I don't know how many of you listened to or looked at clips of uh, the Congress people, Congress, uh, you know, sessions uh, in interrogating Mark Zuckerberg, but they had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> I mean, literally no idea. Um, and so the, the entertainment industry took the, the position that before the government regulated, and particularly in terms of the ratings for content, that they would do it themselves. Uh, and it's been quite effective. Um, you know, they have the ratings, and they've been in, in, in position now for maybe 30 years. I don't know how long. Uh, it works, and it's your responsibility as a parent to, uh, to kind of, uh, you know, discipline that. Um, there are really no talks uh, in the technology uh, industry of self-regulation. I mean, they, they, they talk, Zuckerberg says, uh, we would like to be regulated. He doesn't really mean it. Um, it's... it's and I think he's banking on the fact that, uh, that, that, that the whole government part of this is completely dysfunctional. Uh, and it is. And not only uh, on the administration part, the FCC and all, the, all the other folks, but Congress and the laws. And so they're banking that they can basically outlast all these people. It, is tech actually doing anything that you're seeing to improve that level of regulation or, or indeed improve its, its own behavior as an industry? Apple, Apple has... Uh, and is building into more and more features into their uh, operating system so that you are uh, kind of more c conscious of the data that they collect, they collect. And as you know, they, they, they're also trying to control screen time, which, which is, the, the, I think, the, the biggest issue for us as, as adults or older folks is the effect of all this on our children, uh, and in my case, on my grandchildren. And um, it's devastating. I mean, you see kids in, you know, who are preteen or teens who are basically stuck to their screen uh, all day long and have no social skills, have no desire to play s soccer or whatever it is, don't date. Uh, the, the, you know, the statistics on that are pretty bad. 
teens today don't have sex, as have much less sex than when we used to have. It, it could be a good thing, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and it's all because of the screen. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. Well, a less amorous society is, is, is I suppose, long term good for Well, this none is of not us. being recorded, I guess. <laughs> well, I don't know. There's a camera up there somewhere. Um, no facial recognition in here, though, so we're, we're on good ground. Um, you've called it a national emergency before, this, this need to get back our privacy and, and how important that is. But it doesn't seem like there's any impetus. It seems like the ship has sailed. So if, if, if that is the case, what should we as consumers be doing differently to protect ourselves? I, I think everyone should go into whatever social apps they use and go into the settings and change the settings and make it not acceptable that they're using your data unless you explicitly agree to it. Um, and also the scope of it. I mean, you can reduce the scope of it. Um, and, but it takes work, they don't, as we discussed before. They don't make it easy, and most people don't do it. I, I think that the implications for society are, are enormous. We're building a society that we won't recognize, uh, that we didn't grow into and didn't recognize, and things are going to, you know, are already kind of out of control. Um, and it could be fine. It could be just me complaining, uh, you know, that young people do things differently. I was going to say, this is a lot of every generation to some extent. Yeah. Except I work in the tech field and I know how bad it is. Well, what can you do when you're going out as an acquirer or investing in these companies and obviously helping bring a lot of them through that sort of early stage to fruition? What can you do to tr try and embed that? To say to them, well, look, even if it comes at a competitive disadvantage, the right thing to do is to not use the data in this way and that. Well, we, we try very hard to, to uh, work with our companies so that what they, and everybody has to get, gather data. Otherwise, it doesn't work and the service won't be as good. But there's ways to do it that, are, that, that protect your identity, uh, that are anonymized. Uh, there are things that you're collecting that you have to question yourself, what am I using this data for? In the case of the big firms like Google and, and, um, and Facebook, their, their MO is I'm going to collect as much data as I can, whether I use it or not. You know, it, I'm, I might find use for it later on. Um, so they're, they're, they're just like vacuuming data uh, as opposed to targeting exactly the, the data that, that is needed for them to provide you a quality service and then making it anonymized. So it's not, you can have great services and not, uh, you know, be abusive in terms of data collection. Just thinking of, of one company that seems to always dodge the bullet in this, Amazon. Are, are they better at this than... Facebook, or are they just better at getting away with it? They haven't abused it, at least as far as that we, we know about. As far as we know, uh, they never sold the data to anybody else, um, and 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 no did. And Google has limited um, scope in that. So Facebook really, um, they they've stopped doing a lot of that today in terms of selling. Uh, but but the uh, the you know, it, it's out there. It's once the data is out there, you're not going to get it back. It seems like the right point on which to end then. So, so has it gotten any better since, let's take the Cambridge Analytica point, as kind of the, not the start of this nefarious behavior, but at least it was the start of a lot of people knowing about it and that it was going on on a big scale. Has Facebook and more generally the industry improved at all since then? Openly, Apple is the only one that has declared steps that make it better. I think the litmus test is going to be the 2020 uh, elections uh, because uh, everyone's going to try to you know, uh, abuse it They've again. They've seen how easy it is. <laughs> exactly. So we'll see. There will be more scandals. Uh, that's one thing that we can be sure of. There will be more scandals. Eric Kibbo, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure.